Hello everyone, thanks for joining this short presentation. During the next 20-25 minutes, we are going to introduce a domain of linguistics that is called linguistic description. And this is related to the undergraduate program offered by the Department of Linguistics within the Faculty of Arts at the University of Hong Kong. Maybe for some of you, linguistics is a bit mysterious. And the reason for that is that linguistics is not a topic that is much studied before university. Of course, if you are in Hong Kong, in middle school and high school, you study Cantonese, likely Mandarin, English, maybe another language like French or German or Italian, but you don't study linguistics per se. That is, you don't study how languages work, what are their components, syntax, phonetics, all these things. So, of course, that may be a bit mysterious right now. And that's different from physics, mathematics, or biology, that, of course, you can study at the university, but that you discover actually earlier than that. This being said, Linguistics is a very interesting field and you can study it during a Bachelor of Arts. And there is a program offered by the Faculty of Arts of the University of Hong Kong. Linguistics is actually quite a large field of study. So if you meet two scholars who tell you they are linguists, they may actually work on quite different things. So in linguistics, there are a number of subfields and they each touch on various aspects of language and languages. So for instance, you have phonetics and that the study of speech, let's say the sounds of language and languages and how you can combine them, how they can differ from each other. What is the range of things we can observe in human languages? Then you have phonology, and here the focus is a bit different. You study precisely how speech sounds are used to create words and to make words differ from each other. So it's not only the acoustic properties or the articulatory properties of the sounds, how they sound like and how we produce them, but it's rather how we can use them to create words. And that has to do with how we work with sounds, let's say, in our brains, in our minds. Then there is something called morphology, and that's the study of the structure of words. How words are composed of different parts, at least for some of them. What are the different phenomena we can observe in different languages, the differences? Then we have semantics, which is the study of the meaning of words and sentences. We have syntax, and that the study of how words are assembled together into sentences. And pragmatics, which is how we use language in context. How we may build our sentences and choose our words differently in different contexts. So you see here that these are different subfields that touch on different issues, different questions. Linguistics is also a large field because it connects to quite a number of other disciplines. And the reason for that is that language is very crucial for human beings, for us. We use language every day. And without language, we would be very, very different. So language is such a fundamental aspect of who we are that to really deal with it properly when we study it, we need to connect linguistics with other fields. So for instance, we connect linguistics with biology because we want to understand the biological basis of language. Do we have genes? related to language and how are they related to language. Linguistic is connected to neuroscience because we want to better understand how language is processed 
in the brain. And it is also connected to psychology. How do babies, infants, learn language, for instance? Linguistics is related, can be connected to ethology. Because we want to compare our way to communicate language with the ways other animals have to exchange information. Like monkeys, apes, dolphins, dogs, whatever. Linguistics is also related to history. And there is a field called historical linguistics when you study how languages change through time, how they evolve. And of course, what happened in the past has influenced the way languages are today. Linguistics can also be connected to sociology and anthropology. And we have a field that is called social linguistics here because we use the way we talk as a tool to say who we are. Our language is one of the aspects of our identity. And of course, sociology, anthropology study human societies. And human societies, if I say it slightly differently, are partly defined by the language or the languages they speak. Finally, especially quite recently, you have strong connections between computer science and linguistics with a field, for instance, that is called natural language processing. And the point here is, can we create machines, programs that can understand and generate language? And the point here is that if we make progress in this direction, then we can interact more easily with machines, with robots. So you can see that there are many fields in linguistics, like social linguistics, historical linguistics, psycholinguistics, that come in addition to phonetics, morphology, syntax, and all these fields, of course, have connections uh, with each other. So if you are interested in linguistics, you may find that some aspects are more interesting to you than others, and you may study them more precisely, more specifically with different courses that are offered in the undergraduate program in linguistics. So there are many, many possible approaches to language and languages. That's what we have said in the previous slide. But when we want to work on language, to work on languages, very likely the first step is to better understand the many, many languages which are spoken around us, the languages which are spoken on our planet. On this slide, you can see a small map and you can see that there are different areas with different colors. And in some places, it looks a bit dark because there are so many areas overlapping each other that you cannot really see clearly what is going on. You will need to zoom to really have a good grasp of the situation. All these areas correspond to languages. And very obviously, just by looking at this map, you can see that there are quite many languages spoken on our planet. I can ask you the question, how many languages are spoken on our planet today? And I can make three propositions. First of all, around 500 languages. Second option, around 6,000 languages. Third option, around 25,000 languages. What is the right answer according to you? 500, 6,000 or 25,000? The correct answer is around 6,000. And we don't know precisely because it's hard to have a perfect understanding and perfect knowledge of all the areas on our planet. Plus, sometimes it's not that easy to say that two languages 
or two ways to speak are two different languages or are just dialects of a single language. In other words, the distinction between what we call dialects and what we call languages is not that simple. So we usually say around 6,000. Maybe it's 7,000 or even 8,000. Maybe it's 5,000. It doesn't matter much, but several thousand languages are definitely spoken on our planet today. How do linguists work when they want to better understand the diversity of languages? We've said that the first step is to understand these diversities, to understand how these languages differ from each other, how they are built. So linguists to do that go to where these languages are spoken. They go there and they patiently describe them. They describe their sounds, their words, their sentences, in other words, their phonetics, their phonology, morphology, syntax, pragmatics. They describe them as precisely as they can to have a better understanding of them and to be later able to compare all these languages with each other. So if you are a field linguist, if you describe languages, you will very likely travel to the place where the language you are interested in is spoken. That may be in Nepal. That's on these pictures. You can see a teacher of the department here at HKU and she regularly travels to Nepal to work on a language that is spoken there that is called Nubri. And she will, of course, interact with different speakers. Of course, she will become friend with them and she will work with them to gradually understand their language better. When you start working on a new language, maybe before going to the field, going where the language is spoken, you have looked for information about closely related languages and you know a little bit about how the language will be like. But still, you don't know much about the language. And you need to start by deciphering, finding the sounds which are used to build words and sentences in the language. You need to record things like stories and analyze the sounds that are found in the audio recording. So here we can play a little game. I can make you listen to two languages and I would like you to try to guess what are these languages. So let's first listen to the first recording. So this was the first recording and I can ask you, do you think that this language is Irkariana, which is a language of South America? Do you think it's a language of Australia that is called Miriwung? Or is it a language of Papua New Guinea, which is called Wutung? So is it a language of South America? of Australia or of Papua New Guinea. The answer is Miriwung, which is an which is an Aboriginal language that is spoken in northern Australia. Let's listen to another one. Thank <laughs> you. 
you can hear quite unusual sounds in this language. Sounds like which are called clicks. According to you, is it a sign language spoken in Africa? Is it a Kfirong Kagate language spoken in Nepal? Or is it a Romance language spoken in Switzerland? A language from Africa, from Nepal, or from Europe. This is actually a sign language spoken in the thousand part of Africa. And sign languages are very famous because of their use of clicks. These sounds that you could hear in the recording and which you don't find in many languages. Basically in sign languages and in surrounding languages which have borrowed these clicks from the sign languages. So when you hear a language that you, ha you have never heard before, it seems that it is going to be a very difficult task to eventually understand this language and in particular being able to speak it but is a bit the same when you start learning English or Italian or Mandarin. This is something new and it takes time. You need to be patient. You need to gradually build your knowledge of the language. Linguists describing languages are doing just this, but of course they are experts in describing languages. They know the type of phenomena that can be found in languages. So it's a bit easier for them, but a bit easier doesn't mean that it isn't difficult. So linguists will try to identify the sounds of the language in order to later be able to write down words. And quite often what they do is that they create a dictionary. Initially it will be rather small, some hundreds of words, but then it may grow to some thousands of words. And this is not always easy. And I can illustrate the issue with another uh, small game. I'm going to have you listen to a word. And I would like you to think of how you could write down this word. We can listen to it once again. So how would you write down such a word? That's not something very easy, right? Stuturity. 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 The word you have just heard is actually a word from Serbian, which is a language that is spoken in Eastern Europe and which is very close to Croatian. They are basically the same language, Serbo-Croatian. And this word means to crouch, to hunk, to cower. And you can see how it is written in Serbian. And actually, in Serbian, you can write words with two different alphabets. You have a derived version of the Latin alphabet and you also have the Cyrillic alphabet. And if you look at this word, you can see that we don't have these letters when we write English, for instance. We don't have them when we write French. The S, the S letter with the reversed hat and the C with the accent, these are letters that we don't have in English. And additionally, for the letter, the C with an accent, which is CH, this sound doesn't exist in English or Cantonese. So of course, that is going to be very hard to write such words if you try to use the written systems of the languages you know. 
So to address this issue, linguists have, have spent time to create a system of symbols in order to be able to transcribe all the sounds which can be found in the languages of the world. So this system of symbol is called the International Phonetic Alphabet, or IPA. And you can see one of the latest version on the slide, on the right side. So you can see that you know some of these symbols. They are the letters that you use to write English words, for instance. But then there are other symbols that very likely you are not familiar with. And this is how you can describe hundreds of vowels and consonants or diphthongs and things such as tones in languages which have tones. So if you think of the word we have just listened to, on this slide you can see how you can write it with the symbols from the IPA. And you can see how to write down some words in Cantonese as well. So you use these different symbols. And basically, whatever the language you pay attention to, you should be able to write down this language with symbols from the IPA. And here we should insist on the fact that many languages do not have a written system. But still, you can write down the words with the IPA. So that's a very useful tool, of course. Once you can properly transcribe words, when you can write them down, it's time to move one step further and try to understand sentences. So here the question is, what are the rules which govern how words can be assembled into sentences? And also, what are the rules which govern how the form of words may be transformed when they appear at specific places in sentences? So here you can consider as an illustration a short sentence in English. I ate the apples. How would you analyze this short sentence? And here you need to remember what you have learned about English in terms of grammar, in terms of syntax. How would you analyze such a sentence? And I give you some time to think of it. I ate the apples. This is how linguists would do. Very likely, you know that I is a personal pronoun. That ate is a verb at the past tense. That the is a definite article. And that if you hear apples, you know that that's the plural form of apple because you have an S at the end. So one way to write this down is how it looks like on the slide. I is a personal pronoun, first person singular. And you see that we have abbreviations for singular, for past tense, for definite, for article. This is how linguists will do. Eight, you could say that it's the word it, but the past tense of this verb. The is a definite article, and we have indefinite articles as well. And apple, you can write apple, the singular form, and then pl, pl for plural, that's apples. So the lower line here is called a gloss in linguistics. And glosses are very helpful to understand the morphology and the syntax of a language. So when you work with a new language, 
basically what you will do and that will take quite a while is that you will study sentences of this language and you will write glosses to explain how the language works and rather than writing down too much in a way linguists very commonly use a number of shared abbreviations so that the glosses can be shorter so pst for past tense sg for singular and so on and so on so glossing a language is part of the description of this language what we can do is to compare english with nubri which is a sino-tibetan language that is spoken in nepal and you can see a b c three sentences in that language one sentence meaning i ate another one meaning i ate the apple and a third one i ate the apple but actually you can see that in nubri you can say i ate the apple in different ways and you can see that there is the gloss first person singular personal pronouns for the word nga something like this and by paying attention to the gloss even if you know nothing about this language you will quickly get at least some understanding of how the words and the sentences are built you see that in this language for instance to express the past tense you use an auxiliary yin at the end of the sentence that's different from english but of course you see that there is a word for apple there is a word for it you can try to build correspondences with other languages you know and then you will understand what are the shared things and what are the differences when languages have been described well enough they can be compared and we can investigate how they encode different meanings different significations in different ways when they do so linguists basically discover a wide range of possible strategies linguistic strategies with different words with different structures and some of these strategies are rather simple while others are much more complex and what can be the consequence of having more complex or simpler strategies here there is a very famous question in linguistics and that is does the language or the languages one speaks influence the way one thinks and there is a famous hypothesis the sapir whorf hypothesis which is a positive answer to this question the language you speak influences the way you think think but that's a very debated question that's a very interesting question so in one language maybe some strategies are used and other strategies are used in another language and a consequence is that perhaps speakers of these different languages think slightly differently they, they approach the world in slightly different ways and we can illustrate this idea of different strategies with a couple of examples to conclude this short introduction i can ask you what are the subject personal pronouns in english subject personal pronouns and i'm sure you know them very well although when i use the expression subject personal pronouns that may not be completely straightforward but you know these pronouns very well i you 
he, she, it, we, you, they. I, first person singular, you, second person singular, he, she, it, third person singular, with different options here, and then plural, first person, that's we, you, second person plural, and they, third person plural. So that's for English, and let's say that's rather simple. At least if we compare English with a language like Lardil, which is spoken in Australia. It's an Aboriginal language spoken in Australia. And here you can see that the table has many more cells. In this language, first, you don't only have singular and plural. You have singular, you have dual for two persons, and then you have plural for more than two persons. In English, two or more, we just have we, you, and they. Also, in this language, you have a difference for the dual and the plural between a first person inclusive and a first person exclusive. So to give you an idea of what that means, you are with two people and you are talking to one of them and you say, we are going to see a movie. When you say we, do you include the person you are talking to or do you mean me and the other person but not the person you are talking to? That's the difference between inclusive and exclusive. And finally, in this language, when you meet someone, depending on your, let's say, genealogical relationship, whether you have shared family members and how you are related, you may be in a harmonic or disharmonic relationship with this person. And according to the relationship you are, with the person, you will need to use different personal pronouns. So that's quite different, right? Another illustration we can give is around the action of eating. Whatever you eat in English, whether it's bread, ice cream, bananas, meat, vegetables, you can use the verb to eat. If you look at another language, like Tseltal, you can observe something different. In Tseltal, you have a verb which is quite generic and which means to eat. But then, depending on what you're eating, you can use a specific verb. So if you look at what is presented on the slide, you can see that there is a verb when you eat bananas or soft things. There is a different verb when you eat meat or chilies. There is yet another verb when you eat tortillas or bread. And so on and so on. So you can see that, let's say, the semantic domain of food and of eating looks quite different in English and in Celtal. In Celtal, you have more options to convey the meaning that you are eating or someone else is eating something. And this is something you will find for eating, but also for many other domains, like colors. In some languages, you only have three or four color terms. When in other languages, you have more than that. So different languages have different lexical or morphological syntactic approaches to convey meaning. And the more we know about that, the better we understand language, broadly speaking, through variations between languages. We understand what humans may do, all the different options they have at their disposal. 
To conclude, why should we describe languages? A third thing that I've just mentioned is that because each language is a unique window on the deep nature of human language. And beyond that, because each language is a unique window on the world, especially with respect to the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. The way we speak reflects how we interact with our world. And different human communities may do things partly differently. The issue today is that many languages are disappearing and we don't know them very well. So each time a language that has not been well described dies, and that's very frequent these days, we, lo we lose an opportunity to better understand language, but also beyond that human nature. So that's why linguistic description is so important. So if you have found this short presentation and the issues, the ideas that we have discussed interesting, then of course, please consider joining HKU and consider the undergraduate program in general linguistics so that you can come study with us and understand more what language is about. Thanks for your attention.